Right, good morning and welcome back to Tanya. We're in chapter 49. Um, and uh, we're getting to the end of 49, the end of the uh, last, uh, the theme of the last four chapters, what we, we call reciprocal love, that if we contemplate how Hashem loves us and how Hashem, quote unquote, he goes out of his way to create um, the relationship that he yearned to have with us and showing his love for us, we in in turn will show and mirror this love um, towards Hashem. And in the last week, we, did, we after going through a nice uh, review and all the chapters, we um, we we uh, we briefly went over the idea of how Hashem, when we say Hashem had to quote unquote lower himself or reinvent himself um, through the process of what's called symptom, the process of condensing his infinite light in order to give room, um, to make room for a creation that seems on the outside to be outside of him, outside of outside of, uh, of his existence. Um, in order for us to exist, in order to us to, to come into a relationship, to recognize Hashem's greatness, to recognize how much Hashem yearns this relationship, how much Hashem loves each of us. Um, and if we just think for, for a minute, how Hashem went through this transformation, just so He can talk to us, not just so we can be in existence. Um, in, in return, I want to, I want to, as I want to serve, and I want to um, return that love and that care, um, and that and, and make the relationship deep and real, and nurture the relationship where I'm willing to. And the love is so strong after understanding what how this our relationship is so is, is so, it comes from such a powerful place that I'm willing to forego everything just to make just to, to just to be uh, in this relationship with Hashem, just to bask in the life of Hashem. Um, so when we reflect on this, it gives us the ability to put away all of our own interests, our own um, um, you know desires. Um, as he said at the end, that we're willing to, you know, not look just look in the bottom of 629, and nothing should get in the way personally of circumstantially, neither the temptations of the body nor the animal soul, and circumstantially an overstated concern with finances or family. So basically, you know, we all know that in life, we always are busy with something and things come between. And, uh, and we pick priorities. If you want to know if a person is dedicated to something, is 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 are they willing to forgo all the uh, all the excuses to make this to, to make something happen. So you know we have to uh, serve Hashem so you can say all right how important is my serving Hashem? Is it uh, if after after I took care of my um, I take care of my own priorities, why I define priorities. I'll make room for Hashem. I'll make time for Hashem. So when you say, oh, sorry, I can't do this mitzvah. I can't daven. I can't do Shabbos because I have other obligations, right? When I hear, when I hear people saying I have other obligations, um, I'm, you know, we don't, I don't judge. I don't like to judge people and I try not to judge people. We all, we all, we all, we all victims of that. But when you say you have other obligations, that means you, your, your priority in the first place is not, not important to you. So you, it's hard to say, make it a priority because people don't understand why should it be a priority? The whole approach about our relationship with Hashem has never been explained. It's like, if, 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 if there's most times in general, we look for, you know, Benefit. What's the benefit of something that I'm going to invest my time or my energy in? Because we all, we all, we all, in a sense, that's how we are wired. So you, you ask yourself, okay, so 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 Judaism, Torah, mitzvahs. What's the benefits? So people approach Yiddishkeit from a benefit pers- benefit point of view. They'll say, okay, I, I, uh, okay, this. Okay, Shabbos, it's nice because we come together as a community. Shabbos is nice because we rest. But um, 
but the mitzvah of putting on tefillin, there's no benefit for that. Okay, so that's not important to me. Or I start to see through the lens of what can I gain out of out of this Yiddishkeit thing or this Torah thing, then I to me now today it's more important for me that I have to you know watch this football game. Today it's more important for me to to uh, because it's gonna you know if I don't uh, work on Shabbos I'm gonna lose some money. I have a big deal or my roofer is coming and the only day he can come is on Shabbos. That's more important because what do I mean? My roof has to get fixed. So if it's if it be if it would be your wedding day, you and the roofer calls the day before your wedding day, say, so, ah, sorry, I'm coming to, to fix your roof tomorrow. Sorry, tomorrow is my wedding day. Uh, nothing, uh, my honeymoon. I can't, I, I'm not, you're gonna reschedule it. So the the what Alfred is trying to trying to understand on a very simple, on a simple um idea. Relation Hashem is not a benefit thing. Oh, what can I get out of the relationship? Relation Hashem is, is, is a marriage uh, that Hashem has, has, has included us, has put us into his personal space. And nothing more important to me is to make this relationship happen every single moment, every moment. Everything else is secondary. Not a, con- not a contradiction to, um, you know, what he said earlier, my family and my money. My family is, of course, important. What you're saying here at the end, at the top 6.30, Tanya, of course, not suggesting that you neglect your finances or your family. The main point is that when it's time for worship, other concerns shouldn't be on your mind. Also, if worship is your passion. You will find a way to devote as much time and energy to it as you can. And even more so, as we know through Tanya, that you incorporate your finances, you incorporate your family in your relationship with Hashem. Everything becomes as part of your relationship with Hashem. Continue now with how this actually translates when we recite the Shema. So we know when we say the Shema, um, right after we we say the, the, the declaration, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lekein, Hashem Achad, Hashem, you're one. We say, Rahavtos Hashem Lekechel, you should love Hashem. We translate the belief in Hashem in a, in, in a relationship. Love, loving Hashem ex, 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 expresses a relationship, not just a faith. I declare that Hashem is one, and then I do whatever I want, right? Or, uh, yeah, I believe in God, but God is God is kind of, yeah, I believe in, but he's kind of something completely out of my realm, nothing to do with my day-to-day life. In Torah, right after we make the declaration of faith, we translate it into action, into real action, to real life. So what's interesting is what's the what happens, what it, what's in our prayer before the, the Shema prayer? So we have two blessings we say, two long blessings we say prior the um, the saying of the Shema. We learned about this uh, in a few chapters earlier. First, the first prayer is. If you, if you look at the Siddur, right before the Shema, it's after Ishtabach, when we say Baruch Hu, Baruch, the first prayer begins with Baruch HaTu Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Yotzer Or Ovore Choshech. Blessed are you, Hashem, who created light, who formed light, and you created darkness. Hamei Aretz, and you brought light to the, to the world. And to the inhabitants, and then so Hashem created the, the uh, light. Hashem created darkness, which is creation, and then it goes into the next thing Hashem created, which was Hashem. You created all these angels, all these spiritual beings, and we call them different names in the davening: Hofanim, the Chayot Hakodesh. These angels and the wild angels. And they make a lot of noise, the Rash, Gadol, Misnasim, but they elevate you and they pray to you and they declare Kadosh, 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 right? Holy, holy, are you, who, who's saying this? We are saying what the angels say every single day, how they praise Hashem by saying, Holy, holy, holy is your host. And then the Ofanim, the Chaisu, Rash, Gadol, Misnasim, Gadol, Misnasim, Gadol, Misnasim, Gadol, Misnasim, Gadol, and they say, Blessed you, Hashem. And then 
will continue about creation, and Baruch HaTashem Yotzei HaMa'orot, thank you Hashem for creating all those lights. Second blessing, so it's really about creation and angels. Then the second blessing is Ahavat Olam, it begins with Ahava, with word is love, Olam, with, which means either can mean the world, the universe, like Adon Olam, mass of the world, or Tikkun Olam, right? Olam is world, or Melech Olam, king of the universe, but, or Olam can also mean eternity, eternal, eternal love. So we learned earlier, Sadir talks about how Hashem loved his creation. But which creation? He created the humans. And then he created, and then he chose, the one of Achati, he chose the Jewish nation. They came after Ono and he gave them the Torah. And he brought them closer to him. And he gave us the Torah and he gave us the mitzvahs. What's the connection of creation and angels and Jewish people and Shema to the, to the, to the climax when we say, after we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, HaBolcher, Ba'amo Yisrael, Ba'ava, thank you Hashem for choosing the Jewish people, Ba'ava with love, Shema Yisrael. What's the connection to the pre-blessing to the Shema? He's going to talk about this right here. 6.30, section 3, mirroring God's love during the Shema. The chapter 46, Tanya mentioned that the contemplate method of mirroring God's love is particularly effective at the time when you recite the Shema and its blessings. In the final section, we'll explain why this is the case. And this will help us explain with good reasoning and understanding the rabbinic enactment to recite two blessings before reading the Shema. In the morning, two blessings before it, and the evening, two before it. The Shema is a twice daily biblical ordained declaration of faith, performed by reading aloud certain scriptural passages. The rabbis also introduced two benediction blessings recited before the Shema, which we just mentioned in the introduction. So the question is we need clarification on the matter since superficially, the content of these two blessings. The content of these two blessings are what before the Shema seems to have no relevance at all to the reading of the Shema, as Rabbi Shlomo Ben Adveris has commented, as well as other authorities. So the point of reciting a blessing before mitzvah is to focus awareness and concentration on the act which is about to be carried out. But in the case of the Shema, neither of the two blessings seems to relative direct to the mitzvah. Right? One second, there's some background noise. All right. Yeah. Um, so, 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 in, so, so then, the case of the Shema, neither of the two blessings seem to be relevant to the myth. So the blessing seems to be general praises of God's wisdom and power, the wondrous activities of the angels, and Hashem's love for us. So due to this problem, many authorities have concluded that these blessings are not actually recited on the Shema, but they are merely passions which happens to precede the Shema in the liturgy. So they go, they go with that point, you know. They didn't learn, uh, didn't learn Kabbalah, or didn't learn Hasidus. So they look at the setup of the prayer, and they say, okay, so it's nice about Hashem, but it has nothing to do with the Shema. Sometimes you can have a blessing before the Shema. It just happens that's the, the sequence of the Siddur, but not that it's a a a, pr a preparation for the Shema itself. But the Alter doesn't, doesn't doesn't accept that. So if this is the case. Why are they commonly referred to as as the blessing of the Shema? And why would the place in literally specific for the Shema? So there has to be the, in, in, in Jewish in, Jew, in Talmud, they are called Bichat Chitshma, the blessings of the Shema. There has to be a connection. To answer this question, we first need to clarify the main theme of the Shema reading. What is the main theme of the Shema reading? Rather, it's blessing where placed before the Shema because they prepare you for the main point of reading the Shema, 
which is to inspire you to love God with all your heart, to use uh, the use of the term leva, which lev is heart, rather than the contracted form of lev, right? Which is one, one lev, one heart, levavcha is plural. To suggest the presence of two elements of the heart, which implies that you should love God with both your impulses, both the impulse to good and the impulse to evil, right? Or, or in our language, the nefesh abahamis and the nefesh elokis, the godly soul and the animalistic soul. So how exact? So, 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 what, so what's the whole purpose? The whole purpose of the Shema is you should come to love Hashem. Not just, not, does your neshama need to learn how to love God? No, our soul does not need to love, need to have any meditation or work or has to figure out how to love God. So when Hashem, when, when we are commanded to love Hashem, we're not only commanded to love Hashem through our neshama, through our godly soul, but also through our evil inclination, the impulse to do evil, which is in our heart. When we say love is in the heart, it's referring to the love that you have to train that not only your godly social love God, which is obvious, but also your animal social love God. And he asked the question, how do you do that? <laughs> the opposite. If, if the animal soul or the impulse of evil is, is, is all, its whole existence is to challenge us, right? To challenge us, to challenge, to, 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 to fight the good soul. So how do you want me to convince the evil inclination to love Hashem. So practically speaking, this means overcoming anything that holds you back from loving God. You love God with the impulse to evil by minimizing and disregarding any self-gratifying activities to which it draws you, overcoming anything that holds you back from loving God. So, it, which in, in, so basically, it's not that the evil inclination loves God, but you controlled, you, are, you, you took control of your evil inclination not to allow it to, over, to overtake your, um, your, your, your life and your being, your existence and your way of life that should not be in line of uh, loving Hashem. Because we're, we're, when we say loving Hashem, it's going to continue. Let's, let's read further. Um, Above, above, we pointed to an under concern with family and, and, and finances. That's the two main sources of distractions from worship. Right? What does that mean? Why, what, you know, what are the, uh, the two that those are, these are family and finances be two main sources of distractions from worship. What does that mean? What does that mean? Maybe? Um, so, Money, we don't have to. Uh, it's quite obvious, right? That 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 the monetary it always comes in the way of certain things. Not necessarily that um, that money is more important than God. Which the many, the many it is, right? They worship money as God. But I think he is you're not referring to that level. Oh. You know, me to me, it's more important to make money than God, or to me, it's more important um, that, I, that um, my family than God. Because as we said earlier, money and family is not a contradiction to God. It's all one package. Meaning, incorporate your family to bring God in your family. Incorporate your business that that Shem is a part in your business. And, and, and blossom and give tzedakah. So then you're elevating everything you're doing. Your family is a family that Hashem is, is, is li lives in your family. It's part, of, it's part of why you have family, part of how you incorporate your relationship. And that's not what he's talking about, where, where people who, who, can't, who, can't, who can't put these things together. Rather, I think what he's, talk, he's addressing here is the distractions that come along with our uh, with our busyness of taking care of of, of, of of livelihood, taking care, have to taking care of our families, which is a which is a which is a time consuming and and a distraction. Distraction to what? To uh, want to sit and meditate and pray. 
So, he, so, 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 how do I deal with that? So he's saying here, since you shall love God with your heart, means a worship which is not unduly distracted by your wife and children, to whom a man's heart is naturally bound. As a saint, is a blessed memory com uh, uh, commented on the verse. For he spoke and it came to be. This refers to a wife. He commanded and it remained. This refers to the children. The sages understood that a man's love for his wife and children is not something rational. It's something decreed by God. He spoke and it came to be. And the words, you should love God with all your soul, all your might, follow the implied meaning of health and finances that should not be allowed to unduly interfere with worship. The text of the Shema implies that for the sake of loving God, you ought to let go of your tendency to be overly concerned with all of them. So, so basically, do not the, the 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 idea of the Shema and the meditation to Shema is to help us not to be distracted of things that kind of overtake us. So make this very simple. All right. Um, who doesn't have issues in their families? Who doesn't have issues with their children? Who doesn't have issues with, with you know in relationships? There's always issues. It's not a. It's not a. It's it's it's. it's I haven't yet met one person who has a flawless relationship with all of his family, right? So and and it and it and it's it's all consuming. Same thing as worries about uh, livelihood. So that can become so consuming that it distracts us from serving God with uh, with proper concentration. So we need to take the time in the day to kind of um, realign our our um, our in the core to understand that it's it's not like we are neglecting your issues. No, the issues are real. But don't allow the issues to dilute or to distract you from a very important relationship that we have with Hashem. That's all. And that's the that's really what Shema is all about. If you take the time, a few minutes of the Shema, and that's where he's going to continue. Right? How do we do that? Again, so if a Shema is a to-do list, oh, I've got to say the Shema every day, right? Or if I say the Shema, I'm going to get something out of it. Right now, I'm busy with my family. Right now, I'm busy with my business. I don't have time for that. So I, I can't concentrate. So what's the, what's the approach? The Shema is, 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 is a meditation of your relationship with Hashem. Take a few minutes a day, and that's where the blessing is going to come in. Look how Hashem has, has, has lowered himself, so to speak, because he yearns over the relationship and he gives us all the blessings. As a return, I love Hashem. Those moments I say the Shema, I can be fully present in my in my in my relationship with Hashem. Continue. We're on page 632. So now we have clarified the main point of the Shema. Um, we can return to our earlier question: How are the two blessings before it and the appropriate preparation? The sages were concerned: How can man, or his senses, come to such a state? Man who's very coarse, so to speak, right? Come to such a state where he lets go of an attachment to distraction that are naturally bound to his heart. So to assist in this task, the sages introduced the two blessings before the Shema. The first blessing in the morning, starting with the words, blessed are your God who forms light. When the text of this blessing, the phenomena of the angels and the lineup standing at the heights of the universe, described and elaborated upon at length to convey the greatness of the Blessed Holy One how the angels are all overwhelmed by his light and proclaim aloud with awe and sanctity and claim with awe, holy, holy is God, Kodosh, Kodosh, holy, meaning that he is separate from the ones, from them and does not become properly enmeshed with them. Nevertheless, unlike the heavens, which are separate and removed from God, the angels recognize that 
On the contrary, all the earth is filled with his glory. The earth referring to specific to the source of souls, Knesset Yisra, the Yisra below, as stated above. And the, the angels proclaim in wonder, God's infinite light is far beyond the remote from us, but it is to be found where? In the souls of Israel on earth. And similarly, the angels know as Ofanim and the angels known as Holy Chayos, which are with a mighty noise, offer praise and say, bless be the glory of God from his place. Which again, which is from Ezekiel, which again expresses their, their, their distance from God in that they know where he really is. So they just speak of his place, like something distant, as they similarly say, for he alone is exalted and holy. So to summarize the message of the first blessing before the Shema is, is, is a very special love which God has shown for you. God's infinite is accessible even to, be, to the angels, but he made it available to you. So basically, the, the whole idea of the angels, the description and the language is, is very simple. It's, it, it's a meditation for us to recognize how close Hashem is to us. The angels who, are, who for us, it looks like that they are far, they're much closer to God. Who's closer? The angels or humans? Angels are closer because they're spiritually, they're much, they're much more refined. Angels don't have an evil inclination. Even don't, a, a, angels don't have any physical parents, no physical bodies, right? They have no distractions. They don't have a business and they don't have family. So angels are fully focused. Yet what they are, and, and what, what, how is their prayer, or how do they express their their, their, their their honors of Hashem? By saying how Hashem is so amazing, Kadosh Kadosh, He's so amazing, but He's so far from us because there's no, Hashem is infinite, beyond infinite. Hashem is, is incredibly distant from us angels, and we pray to you, Hashem. But the, what, what's this next thing they say? The only the only a closeness that Hashem has, he doesn't have a closeness to his angels. We are completely in a different realm. We are so distant. And Hashem didn't create the angels to have a relationship with the angels. Where did Hashem choose to have a relationship with the souls, with the souls of the Jewish people? That's what it says in the Zohar. Knesset Yisrael. And that's where Hashem is close. So the angels look, one second. They're watching what's happening. God in a different realm, Baruch Shem Kvod Machotol Olam Vaed, or Baruch Kvod Hashem Im Koma, bless Hashem from His place, meaning it's a distance. But where is there no distance between God and 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 something else when it comes to the souls of the Jewish people? There, Hashem is intimately close, which is here to make us recognize how close Hashem is to us. And then it continues. The Tanya highlights a similar theme in the second blessing before the Shema. And then in the second blessing, which begins with the words, with a worldly love, Avat Olam, you have loved us, God, our God, implying, see, we have the angels, they don't say our God, they say God is in a faraway place. Mim Komo, Hashem is in his place. When it comes to us, the Jewish people, all of a sudden, what does Hashem say? Ahavat olam. I, it's the, it's, 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 it's avat olam. It's the love. It's the love, the worldly love. Ahavtanu, that Hashem loves us. Where it loves us. God is our God, like we say in the blessing. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech haolam. We say, bless you Hashem elokeinu. Our God, not God somewhere in a different realm, implying that God disregarded the entire brigade of supernal holy angels, and he caused his presence to rest on us, to be called our God, as in phrase, the God of Abraham, as mentioned above. And this, as we explained above, is because love squeezes the flesh out of love for us. He diminishes light to be compatible with our existence. Hashem created a symptom in order, the contraction of his infinite light, in order to be as, as close, as so, such closeness that no other creation 
not even the angels have the ability to, to have. So now the Tanya highlights more hints of this idea in the next of the second blessing. And that's why the second blessing before the Shema is referred to as the worldly love, Abad Olam. Kabbalistic works such as the Tanya follow the Zohar distinction of great love, Ava, Rabba, and worldly love, Abad Olam, as referred to two different levels of love. Why is it called Ava Rabba? Because a person who's in that state of love is connected to the higher world. Avat Olam is the secret of the lower world. So the term Avat Olam is often translated in prayer books as everlasting love. But since the Tanya discussed it based on the Zohar, Avat Olam is a love associated with the lower worlds. The term is translated here as worldly love. So the second blessing refers to worldly love because God's love for us is expressed with the diminishment of his great boundless light into a limited form, the term world implied limitation. And he did this out of love for his people as well to bring them close to him so they can absorb in his non-dual oneness through serving, through observing the Torah. And that is also why we say in the second blessing for the Shema that with great abundant compassion you have com you, you have compassion towards us. Well, meaning a compassion greater than any closeness shown to the whole to the whole heavenly brigade of angels. The second blessing list states, and you chose us from every people and tongue, referring to his choice to be worshiped through our physical body, whose, sen whose, sen whose senses and inclinations seem in identical to the bodies of other nations. And the second blessing continues, and you brought us close for the great name of love to give thanks to you, the meaning of giving thanks being explained elsewhere and, and proclaim your unity, meaning to be absorbed in God's unity as mentioned above. So basically, the idea is that the Hashem has put away, so to speak, his greatness, his great light, in order to have a relationship with us. He chose us, and he, and he says he chose us from every from every people, it refers to um, his choice that we should worship Hashem through our bodies. What does that mean? That the, the, the expression of our relationship is not only through our soul to be spiritual, but by also through our bodies. And that's where the whole idea of mitzvah, which is a physical action that expresses the love that we have for Hashem, because it is, it is, it is, it, it, we look, we look at, we look at us and say, look, we are physical beings. And yet Hashem chose us physical beings over our uh, over angels, over just souls, because if Hashem wanted a relationship with souls, he could have kept our souls in Garden of Eden, not bring us down in this physical world into a physical body. All of that comes out how intense Hashem yearned to have this closeness with us in the physical body. And now I, can, uh, now I express that by saying the Shema, that the declaration of my face translates that I, I love you, Hashem, Rahafta, how do I love Hashem? By the performance of the mitzvahs in the Torah, as we're going to see soon. So having demonstrated the theme of God's love for you. Um, in the blessing before the Shema, the Tani now discusses the corresponding feeling of love for God, which you will experience when taking these words to heart. And this is the final answer to our question. How are these blessings in preparation for saying the Shema? So when, when any intelligent person will impress these words upon the depth of his hearts and mind, then instinctively, as in water, face reflects face. His soul will be ignited. So the, the key really is when any intelligent person, meaning it, re, it re requires a reflection. It's not something we just do out of faith, but you, it requires to meditate and reflect on this, con this idea. And then, if you if you reflect this idea how Hashem has lowered Himself all to be close to you, instinctively as water faces reflects, you know, like, like we mirror, the soul will be ignited, and He will be infused with a generous spirit to willingly disregard and relinquish everything that is His. So God pushed aside His infinite light so as to have a relationship with you. He disregarded the sweet songs of millions of angels and chose to focus instead on your worship. He even chose your body to be sacred temple dedicated to his worship. Right? And he knows it's not perfect. I and mean, he knows you're not an angel. But regardless, he wants the relationship with you the way you are. 
So when you ponder these thoughts, your heart will want to mirror all that love back to God. And you will want to be devoted only to connect to God and be absorbed in his light with attachment and fervor, with the intensity of kissing and merging of spirit with spirit as mentioned above. The goal of awakening God for God is to inspire your devotional attachment to him. In his most intense form, this devotion compared to a kissing or merging of spirit with God, as we have discussed previously. So what's this kissing idea at the end? Just the next part um, here in Tanya. Um, so we discussed this earlier. Kissing is, is, a, is the most deepest way we, we express our love, which a kiss is not just a, a touch. Kiss is with, with his breath to breath. So, so, so there's a, the ability to connect to Hashem on a, such an intimate level that it's expressed like a kiss, which means that there's the breath, our breath, that connects with, so to speak, the breath of Hashem and vice versa. Obviously, it's all, as an, it's all in an allegorical way, not in a physical way. What does that mean? It's going to explain it in the next part. But, but we have established why now we had the two blessings before the Shema. To help us to help us realize that all the two blessings before the Shema talks about all the greatness Hashem created, all the angels, everything just, but that all is nothing to the to the creation and the and the and the chosenness when Hashem chose us, right? The chosen people, not as uh, that we are better, but Hashem chose us. He wants a relationship with each of us, not in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense, where we bring heaven down to earth we bring god into our physical existence how do we express back which now when i say the shema and i understand that i i now want to express and mirror that love how do i mirror that love that is through this kissing idea what's this kissing idea let's 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 let's, let's continue we're in section four be as intimate with god as you can from the above discussion you could get the impression all God requires from you is to have a feeling of love for him. He a desire to escape your existence and return your soul to him. This, of course, is not true. Judaism requires worship through action in this world, not to, not to escape from it. So this is really a big uh, topic where we think of love as being a feeling, right? We think love is a feeling. Um, now, of course, love is a feeling, but, and especially in many other, maybe maybe many, many other spiritual, um, um, call it religion or philosophies, right? Where the whole concept of being spiritual, being close to God is, is, to, is to try to detach yourself from the mundane, detach yourself from your from your physical body as much as you can to have a spiritual experience where you close your eyes and you lift your hands and you love Hashem through every bar, vein of your being and you have that strong sense of love and you love and you and you can express it and say it over and over how much you love Hashem, which is all beautiful, which is all important. But Judaism says that's not enough. Judaism says not only that's not enough, that that is just a, a, a entry or the foundation for the end result, for the purpose, and that is to worship Hashem through actions in this world. Not to escape from it, but to actually do it in action. Let's read. The Tanya suggests that the next verse of the Shema addresses this issue. But since Judaism demands worldly activity, how is this merging of spirit with spirit achieved, practically speaking? To explain this, because you can think that the, the merging of spirit and spirit 
should is is the opposite when it's in a physical is if it's in the physical world. If I close my eyes and I have this very elevated spiritual experience, that I feel the most intimate with God. I'm I'm, I'm completely swallowed up in God's presence. But that's not. But but so how can be emerging spirit spirit achieve when Judaism requires us to be engaged in worldly activities? Explain this. The next verse of the Shema states, and these the words of Torah shall be upon your heart, and you shall speak of them. The third verse of the Shema teaches us that devotional attachment to God, merging spirit with spirit, is achieved practically speaking through Torah study. Emotional longing for God alone won't connect you with Him. And this is an important line. For how could a finite being such as yourself bridge the, 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 the chasm that separates you from an infinite God? The bottom line is I'm finite and God is infinite. So there is a, a separation. There is a different, there's a gap that I have to cross. So how can we cross my limited existence to something, to connect to something that's completely fine, infinite? Just because I feel close to God doesn't mean that it's close on God's level. Not only does it mean it can't even, it's, it's, it's a country, it's, it doesn't work because we are talking completely on two different, there's a, there's a gulf between us and God. The level the world of God's infinite life and my little stack of existence. So the only bridge, the only bridge that's available is how God prescribed it. So for that, however, within the Torah, God has placed his very self. So when you take the Torah upon your heart, understand that deeply you merge spirit with spirit, and God kiss and God and, 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 and kiss God, so to speak. So we learned it above in chapter five. And this is the, the gift that God gave us his Torah. What's the Torah? The Torah is God's wisdom. So as we learned above in chapter five, the mind to mind connection with God that takes place through Torah study is quote unquote, a phenomenal merging experience. There's no other merging experience like it nothing remotely comparable exists in the physical world where you become completely one with another entity from every conceivable perspective. So what's the, the, the as in chapter five we learn that a, a um, emerging experience of, of mind, if I, if I comprehend um, a piece of wisdom that was taught to me by somebody else, my mind becomes ex extremely close to the or or this emerging of my 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 power of understanding with an idea that came from Mr. So and so, and now this idea is part of my brain. So 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 Hashem yearned that we should have a a a a, a close connection to Hashem, not just by feeling, but by something much more tangible. So Hashem in his infinite greatness gave his wisdom to us. He lowered his wisdom, so to speak, and he placed his wisdom in the words of Torah. So when we study Torah, there is this union, this is intimacy that happens that my understanding, that my, my being can understand an actual piece of God that becomes part of me. And that's what he refers to, how I kiss. So how do I kiss Hashem when I study Torah? What's kissing? Kissing means there's something coming together. How do I come? How do I physically connect to Hashem? Physically, in the meaning, in the sense, where I phys my physical presence, not just my soul, connects to God. My soul is always connected to God. That's not a big deal. It's not. That's not. The, it's not the purpose why God put me in the physical body. Well, God put me here so I can affect a intimate relation with Hashem while I'm being in the physical in the, in the physical body. So basically, what's all coming out, you know. Judaism is all about, not about going up to heaven, right? So who wants to go to heaven? Judaism is, is how to bring heaven down to earth. Well, 
if Jesus would be about going up to heaven, why, 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 why did God have to create the whole physical world in the first place? If that's if that was the purpose, God says my purpose is to create a physical world because I want my home to be my presence, my shechina to be dwelling in the physical world. So how do I achieve that? Not by becoming more spiritual by disengaging myself from my physical existence, but on the contrary, bringing heaven down to earth via the study of Torah, via doing the mitzvahs, I bring the godly, the, 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 the God's essence into the in, into a physical experience. Still, the metaphor of kissing implies a raw connection of spirit. Page 637. Still, the metaphor of kissing implies a raw connection of spirit, not the cognitive one. So how could the Tanya equate kissing God with the connection of the mind? But stated in its Chayim, the union which God describes as kissing. So Chayim is one of the famous books of the Kabbalah. That the union which God describes as kissing is primarily the union of your mental faculties of Chachma, Bina, and Das with God's Chachma, Bina, and Das. So Chachma, Bina, and Das are the three levels of intellect. So if we use our faculties, our intellectual faculties, the, all the three levels, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom, with God's wisdom and God's knowledge and God's understanding, God's Chachma, Bina, and Das, which, is our, which in our case of these words upon your heart, refers to the cognitive analysis of Torah, meaning that we not just read Torah, not just say words of Torah, but that we, we, we deeply connect our cognitive, our brain, our understanding, learning Torah in depth by, by analyzing and learning it and understanding, I can, the more deeper I understand, the more deeper I go into Torah learning, the deeper and the more kissing, so to speak, the more intimate I am with Hashem's Chachma Bina Das. The time defines hugging God as an emotional connection and kissing God as a mental one. This is ample proof for the Tanya, this is ample proof of the Tanya assertion that uh, here that in depth uh, Torah study, which with the mind, is an intimate ex experience of kissing God. So we now establish a source for the idea, but an explanation is still lacking. Why should a connection to God with the mind be compared to a kiss performed with the mouth? Generally speaking, Torah study can be divided in two categories. All right. Um, I, 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 it's, it's late, and I, I'm wanna, I don't want to stop smack the middle, but I do want to come back here right next week um, to take apart a little bit more of that concept of Torah study. Um, which is a beautiful idea because it's something we can incorporate and we're doing right now. We, you know, we're sitting here and what are we doing? We're learning Torah in depth. So our learning right now is we, we, we are experiencing a kissing of God. Um, but, um, but he's going to go in here a little bit more um, in the powers I mentioned in the introduction before we started the class, the power of speech that in addition to study, which is with our mind, in the Shema we say, Vedi bar tabam, and you should speak of it. Not only you should learn, you should also speak of it. So there is an extra um, uh, idea and extra importance to actually verbalize the words of Torah. Not just pray, but verbalizing when I study. When you could think study should be, is typically quiet, it's with your mind. Why do I have to verbally speak every word of Torah that I'm thinking or I'm debating? So there's something very powerful about that because, again, it's going to go into the idea that God created the world with speech, with the creation, and, and, and will bring us back what this kissing is all about. Because kissing is all breath. So this idea of breath, it's, it's way too late, so we're going to continue next week. Um, we'll finish the chapter and we'll start next, uh, next week also, chapter 50. All right. Great seeing everyone. Rabbi, I would like to ask you a question. When we come to any house, we kiss mezuzah. So it's in a way, it's imaginary that we're kissing God too? Um, 
it's a different it's a it's a it's a very different um because here we're talking a a actually we're talking we're talking kissing as a as a very deep experience a deep experience that requires us to do something acquires work to study torah requires to use our mental capacity to grasp the wisdom of hashem you know uh, kissing the mezuzah, it's nice, it's beautiful, but that's, in a sense, it's, very, it's, it's almost going back, I love Hashem, which is good, which is nice, but we are we are de delving much deeper than just a superficial expression of I love Hashem. So, it's so much so that when we refer to kissing in here and learning the teaching here and the Zohar and the Kabbalah, as, that, that we have the ability to kiss Hashem it does not, it's not the mezuzah at all. That's, that's a, that's just a little nice custom. That's a, what, just a physical world. It's the, just a ritual. It's just not an action. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's not even a mitzvah to kiss a mezuzah. It's a mitzvah to have a mezuzah. It's not a mitzvah to, to, to kiss a mezuzah. It's our expression. Like, I, like this is more a, 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 an external expression. I love Hashem. But, but we're here, we are talking about a real deep kiss, the deep kiss that Hashem has given us access to by learning Torah is not, as we learn, it's not a, um, it's not optional. It's a requirement. It's a mitzvah. It's an obligation, but not obligation sense. I have to do this, right? In the relationship, right? In relationship with your spouse, Right. If you if you if it's just about kissing and saying I love you, without getting to know each other deeper and deeper, right? When the, when the, when the, when there is a when there is a when the when the when you take the relationship and you and you and you mentally connect, and then you connect and you do what each other what what the other other party um, so much enjoys or so much gives you access to. Versus, oh yeah, I just love you. I just kiss you. That's it's nice, important, but not that should not that shouldn't that's not where it ends. That's kind of the, the entry point. But taking that to a much much uh, deeper level of express of expression of deep expression of why you love each other and what do you do for each other. That's what the that's a true kissing uh, that we're referring to here. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yep. On the bottom of page 632, mm -hmm. it says, nevertheless, unlike the heavens, which are separate and removed from God. This is mm -hmm. not literal, right? Separate and removed. Meaning, me, me, meaning in the, in, so Hashem, Hashem exists everywhere. Hashem's presence everywhere. But where does Hashem choose to dwell to dwell, meaning where is Hashem's home? And ours, and ours, but he still exists in heaven. Yeah, of course, not? of course. Then why of it course. says separate and removed from God? From from the from 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 meaning they, they have they don't have the ability to connect to Hashem. When Hashem created created them, Hashem created it out it, from him, but now it's outside of him. So they don't have the the light is inaccessible to angels on only to us. The what? The the light, God's infinite light. It's on six thirty three. The, the the intimacy of God's light with 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 with, with another entity is only only available for 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 us, Humans. not for angels. So what is the relationship between angels and God? They are just messengers. They are messengers. Yeah. But it's not a closeness. It's not a relation. It's not a relationship. Meaning, it's not. And again, relationship is is goes both ways, right? So it's almost one. It's one. It's one direction. You're my messenger. So whatever Hashem wants, they'll do. But they don't have the ability to express in a, in, in in to mirror that love, the Hashem, the light that Hashem Hashem has created to them. Thank you. They're jealous. They're really. That's what it says. The angels are jealous of, 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 a, of a mitzvah of one mitzvah you do. 
even if you don't have the proper kavana, you don't have the proper meditation, right? If you give tzedakah and you put on tefillin, the angels are jealous, they wish to have that ability to connect to Hashem through the action that we do, that Hashem has given us access to connect to Him. But they still have lots of func missions, functions to do good for us. Yeah, yeah, yes. They're, they're, they're here to assist us. Yes. They're here to assist us. Um, and, they're, and, they're, and, 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 and they're sisters, but, but that's, they're, 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 not the, they're not the purpose. So, so Rabbi, God have no feelings to them? They just, they're just servers, that's what it is? What, what does that mean? Well, God loves us, but uh, angels, no. they just... Love no, is not Hashem, love, the way no. we understand. Hashem, Hashem created them, Hashem definitely has also a... Uh, he loves but but the point here is that, that, that God wanted you know that lonely child right that lonely that one child that's uh that is that looks as an outcaster that nobody looks at that, that looks so far removed that's that, that's what Hashem wants to be with <laughs> the other ones the perfect the perfect people Hashem enjoys them but that's not a big deal to them because they're just robots. Hashem created them with no evil inclination, with no with 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 no uh, you know with no distractions. So if they if they sing a hallelujah, it's cute, it's nice. But that doesn't excite Hashem, so to speak. But it there are us. archangels, huh? There are archangels that have different functions than regular angels, Mike. You know, yeah. Raphael, yeah, Michael, all, yeah, Gabriel, but, they all, but they all again, they all have functions to with a certain their messengers. Meaning, they all they can be a bigger macher, a smaller macher, right? Bigger minister, a smaller minister. But Hashem created them so they can they they can serve the end result, which is the purpose and mission that God wanted to dwell in this physical world and have relation with us. Same with Metatron. Even though he's his right hand, so to speak. Again, it's it's all the all direct. It can be all a direct um, expression of Hashem. But Hashem didn't create the, this all these these powerful angels because Hashem yearned to have a relationship with them. I get I understand. So between us and God, there is an angels. That's that's the because we probably wouldn't be able to take God's energy. We. That's what it is, Rabbi. It's a different, it's, it's a whole different function. Well, it's, like yeah. a, it's like a one-way street versus a two-way street. So the the relationship, Rabbi, I believe, is saying he's there is a relationship, so it's back and forth, and it's a two-way street. Between God and his angels, they are there to serve. They there isn't a two-way street. It isn't within their realm to disagree or I'm too tired or... But... And, 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 That's the simplest way I can put it. Yeah, if, 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 not that we compare angels to robots, right? But let's assume we could use that analogy. So God, so you have a lot of robots, right? You have computers, you have, uh, you have AI, you have all these computers. What are they do to... They're, they're here to make our life more productive, right? But we don't we don't worship them. They have no freedom of choice. Maybe now it's getting uh, more difficult to understand that. But um, but the um, and, and and so the angels were, up, were were created to be messengers to give us all the tools so we can serve Hashem. The the, the angels don't have okay today. I want to serve God, and tomorrow I don't want to serve God. No, they have requirement that every morning they have to say certain prayers that is pre-programmed, so to speak, in their in, in their existence. That's so, the fabric. That's so, what and, it is. Yeah, but don't get the, but don't but don't um, Richie said earlier, they're not between us, they're not between Hashem yeah. and us, they're angels. They're not they're it's not a, between it's us. It's a different, it's a whole they're, different thing. They're, they're, they're just channels to send us to, to get to give us to give us certain messages and, and, and energies, but they have absolutely no uh, no say in our relationship. I know. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank yes, you. good stuff. We'll speak. Uh, we'll, we'll continue next week. Uh, wow. It's getting Thank late. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh,